You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Professor Sean Benish to talk about his new book, Intro to the City. We chat about his love of pre-Columbian cities, how being an ordained pastor connects to his urban thinking, and some thoughts about opening your mind when it comes to place. Stay with us. Today's podcast is brought to you by our generous Patreon supporters. Thanks so much for supporting this podcast as well as Mondays at the Overhead Wire. We couldn't produce the show without your help. To join this merry band of dreamers and support the show, go to patreon.com slash the Overhead Wire. For $2 a month, we'll send you stickers and a handwritten note. For $10 a month, we'll send you one of our famous bus-only scarves. We just got in a new shipment, so we're ready for the new year. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the projects of the Overhead Wire sharing information on cities around the world with our readers and subscribers. Join us and try our one-of-a-kind daily newsletter for two weeks free. No credit cards, just an email address by visiting theoverheadwire.com. We've got 71,000 news links in our archive tagged by topic, so sign up and search away. And finally, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention our audiobook version of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic, Town Planning in Practice. Go to raymondunwin.com to find out how you can download the book in your podcatcher and listen to each chapter like an episode of the show. We have a free Word document with timestamps on the site as well. Before we get to this week's show, I want to let folks know that they can get this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, and of course, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And subscribing means you get both this show, Talking Headways, and Mondays at the Overhead Wire, where this music I'm talking about comes from, on the same feed. Two fun podcasts, one great channel. Subscribe today. Sean Benish, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. So right now I work as a professor at Warner Pacific University. Um, I teach a variety of subjects in different departments. And yeah, that's basically what I do. How did you get into cities? Well, it's a good question. Since I grew up in rural Iowa, I did not come about it easily. So I actually, but I mean, it's part of my story. So I grew up terrified of cities, didn't like cities. I didn't get cities. I wanted nothing to do with cities. And then fast forward the storyline, we were living in an immigrant and refugee neighborhood in Vancouver, British Columbia, surrounded by the city. And that was really the first time that I began wrestling with what is a city and other related topics from urban design to transportation. So, yeah, that's kind of how I really fully started embracing cities. What brought you to Vancouver, BC? So we were working on starting an outdoor adventure nonprofit. Oh, that's cool. What uh, kind of adventures were you going to (laughs) have? Well, it was (laughs) so there's a lot of little subplots woven through. So. For a number of years, when I was in grad school in Southern Arizona, I worked as a hiking and mountain biking guide, just took people out into the desert for hikes, mountain bike trips. And so that came about the idea of doing some of that, but really focusing on populations that don't readily have access to outdoor adventure. So it was doing that, but with an intentional inclusion of different population groups. That's cool. Your book is Intro to the City, but it's not your first book. What do you usually write about? So I first started writing about cities, but from more of a biblical and theological perspective. And then it started kind of migrating outwards related to different courses that I'm teaching. Could be from bikeability to other kind of ministry topics to community and economic development to gentrification and more. Well, that's really interesting. Tell me about the connection between the church and city, and I, I will get into it a little bit more later, but I'm just curious. I thought it was an interesting that you had a chapter in the book about the things that are sacred. Yeah, so spoiler alert, I am an ordained pastor, so there's that part of me, right? So my first doctorate I received in global urban studies was from a seminary, and it was really through that experience. And my focus of my dissertation was researching churches, new churches in gentrifying neighborhoods, 
and basically what kind of impact that they were having. Were they doing anything in the community, et cetera? So that from that experience, that led me to want to continue to pursue more education. And then when we landed in Portland, that's when I started a PhD in urban studies with a focus on planning and development work there. So I've always had this kind of fusion of sorts. So there's then a part of me where for a lot of years I have worked professionally in the ministry arena, whether as a pastor or working for a church denomination, helping churches. And really, I would say the catalyst that got me really interested and involved in cities was when I was in Southern Arizona, particularly in Tucson, and my role was to help catalyze new churches, not just across Tucson Metro, but all the way down to the border. That was the first time I had begun thinking about like what impact can churches, in particular new churches, have in communities, in particular communities of color, places in neighborhoods or small towns in economic decline. So that's these two worlds of development work and local church ministry started coming together. I'm curious, you got the two PhDs. What was the difference in education in terms of from the secular to the religious? I would say some of it would be related to like on the seminary level, focusing more on kind of like a biblical and theological understanding of cities. Like, so what does the Bible have to say about cities? Is there like a blueprint in there for like a just and equitable city? And I end up writing about that in one of my books. It's called Blueprints for a Just City and kind of wrestling through these kind of conversations, but from a biblical and theological framework. So I would say it's a lot of that. That would be kind of the more of the focus. So it's not just like community or economic developments from like the faith-based perspective, whereas like at Portland State, it's just, you know, urban history courses urban planning, bike ped planning kind of courses. So a little bit different of the focus. One would be, yeah, more theological, biblical, and faith-based foundation. And the other is just studying cities. And that leads me to my next thought is you're really fascinated with pre-Columbian cities, cities that were here before Europeans in North America. I'm curious kind of how that came about and how that interest was sparked. Yes. So I mean, honestly, it was that five-year stint as a hiking and mountain biking guide. I would say I always had a love and fascination of history before studying it, you know, more thoroughly in school, in particular urban history, but really as a guide, going out on the trail every single day and where our trails were that we hiked would go through all kinds of remains from village sites from the Hohokam. So you hike along, there's pottery shards everywhere, there's walls, there's foundation walls from pit houses, and a lot of it was just unexcavated. And all throughout the Santa Catalina Mountains there in Tucson, just hiking, whether it's through washes on the trail, I just learned to spot pottery, all these kind of things everywhere. And it just drew me in to go, wait, like, what, what is all this? Why is this here? Who are the people? And that really began developing this deep love for pre-Columbian urban history and kind of expanding out on that. So the Southwest was a great place to be because of the arid climate. So many things are just so well-preserved over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And that really started it. And then more formally, you know, in school and higher ed, and then later on teaching on urban history, it just continued to build on that. But to me, I guess then the fascination was, again, growing up and learning about like American history and all that, like we never talked much about like, actually there was an urban history, you know, pre-Columbus and it was a pretty substantial urban history. And I'm not talking just the Mayans or the Incans, Mm -hmm. but here in the continental U.S., whether it's, you know, Chaco Canyon in New Mexico or Cahokia in, you know, east of St. Louis. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I, I've been fascinated by those places and Mesa Verde and others like it, the hill dwelling. My grandma was actually born in, and you talk about, <laughs> here's another connection, you talk about copper mining <laughs> yes. in Arizona. And actually, my grandmother was born in 1913 in Jerome, Arizona. And obviously, that was a big mining town. And we went to a number of the places around there in Cottonwood and a lot of the ruins that uh, exist. And it's really a fascinating thing to go back and look at those places and think of what was there and why it was there, and then how did it disappear as well? 
Is that something that you think about fairly often? I'm guessing so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably way too much. <laughs> so yeah, and again, it comes out like in my urban history course that I get to teach because part of the course we look at, since I'm here in Portland, Oregon, looking at like kind of the, the, the history of how Portland got started. And it's just like, it's fascinating. Like, well, why Portland? You know, when there's a, a number of other similar size beginnings in the area, what was it about Portland that made it? And what was it about those other communities that didn't? Same with the mining towns. Why did some cities make it? Why did the Jeromes of the world not make it? And I talk a little bit about in the book, another mining town, Bisbee in Southeast Arizona, just the, the fascination that at one point it was the largest city between St. Louis and San Francisco, yet Probably most people have never heard of it. So why did those cities make it? And what was it about Bisbee that was different? And that gets into other conversations about, you know, the economics of the city I and mean, even spills into other things like climate, et cetera. Do you have a city, a uh, pre-Columbian city that if you could go back in time, you'd pick to live in? I, <laughs> in the U.S.? Um, sure. Boy, well, I don't know. I just finished reading a book, kind of a nerdy history of Chaco Canyon area and all those urban developments along there. To me, that's fascinating. Just the whole infrastructure they had with roadways and multi-story buildings. So I would probably pick there also because I love the desert. Nice. Well, so this is a book of questions, and I feel like I've done an interview on myself reading it, which is an interesting <laughs> twist on a lot of the books that I read. What do you think I should ask you after you've already asked me so many questions? <laughs> well, I guess pertaining to the book, you're right. That's that's what it's for. My hope is to spark curiosity. And I said it in the beginning, it came out of teaching a course called the same thing, Intro to the City or Introduction to the City. And these are students that had never really thought about cities before ever. And now all of a sudden, whether they're an elementary education major or a business major, they're in my class. And so my job is to really cultivate that curiosity of cities and love for cities because, you know, my students come from suburbia, from rural communities, et cetera, but they'd never thought about cities before. And so that's why I love asking questions and whether we're hitting this topic or that or going on a field trip, I always love following up with like, well, what stood out to you? What was an aha moment or what was something that you've seen or that you heard that you had never thought of before? And that would be, yeah. So for you, like even reading the book, like you said, it's, there's a lot of questions, but I'm always curious as to like, what was the takeaway from it? Most of my takeaway was a lot of your interests. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but I might be a weird audience for that specific question because I, I do go through so much information on a daily basis. I mean, there's not a lot of discussions about the things that you talk about, like religion, like uh, the sacred spaces, mm -hmm. like thinking mm -hmm. about economics in a different way and race. I was struck by a lot of those discussions as well. And the different way that you came about it than maybe other authors might, and especially other authors from maybe Portland. Yeah, and probably because I was writing it thinking about a 19-year-old or 20-year-old sitting in my classroom, having never thought about this. They're not urban studies majors. They're not aspiring urban planners or anything like that. But what would I, what could I present to them that would stimulate their thinking, increase their, their curiosity and even fascination? And even for a lot of students, just kind of warm them up to like, cities are actually pretty cool. They're not like these terrifying places. I also like that one of your classes is kind of an intro class that a lot of people have to take, even if they aren't kind of urban studies fanatics. You know, those students, they must be interesting to kind of see their eyes open a little bit to the world of cities as well when you teach that class. I'm curious kind of what the response is generally from those students that come in. I think a common theme would be they start off in the class saying, I don't really like cities. I don't get cities. And I could understand because as I shared earlier, that was me growing mm -hmm. up in rural Iowa. Like I just didn't get it. So I, I understand that. So for me to introduce them physically as well, because half the course is field trips, except right now in the midst of COVID. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I always love hearing the aha moments to go like, oh, when we 
visited this homeless camp. Like I just, I never thought about this before. I never saw this or I never wrestled with this before. And so for them just to kind of eventually warm up to the idea of cities, that they're great places. Yeah. And that's, it's an essential tool, the field trip, I feel like. And it's something that I wish that we would have done more when I was in planning school. When I was in undergrad at Texas in geography, one of my professors, uh, Professor Davies, you know, we got in a van, like kind of like your your Dekine van <laughs> you talk about in the, <laughs> in the book. We got in a van and we all went to go get Central Texas barbecue. And he talked about the history of the hill country and the geography of it. And it was really fascinating as something that stuck in my mind, mm. unlike, you know, studying in the study hall or going to the library mm-hmm. every night. You know, it's kind of something that repeats itself. But going out was really formative. I'm wondering, you know, now that the pandemic is here, you can't do the field trips, but how many field trips do you go on and how do you, you think that impacts how people who are in the classes see the city with you? Yeah, so the way that course is designed, it's, it's a block setup. So we'd meet three hours on a Friday afternoon, which is good and bad, Friday afternoon, right? So over the course of a semester, you know, for 16 weeks, I would have it set up where we spend one week in the classroom, let's say talking about the economics of the city. And then we'd spend the next week out in the city. So for like the economics, we were talking about like, you know, the transition to a post-industrial economy, the creative economy, the knowledge economy. And then we would go do for fun, like a third wave coffee tour. And we'd visit different roasters. We'd learn about you know, the whole coffee scene and we drink coffee. And so for me, I like field trips because it, it makes studying cities tactile. So instead of just talking about like the history of Portland, we sign up to do like a historic walking tour of downtown Portland. And so we're, we're seeing the city, we're walking the city, we're smelling the smells, we're hearing the sounds as they learn about the history of Portland. That's just something we miss is just utilizing our senses in studying cities. Yeah. And that's something I took away too from the book is thinking about how a place smells. I mean, that's something that <laughs> yeah. you think about it. I mean, I, I remember going to Northwest Arkansas and Fayetteville, which is where the University of Arkansas is. And the track that we ran on, after you'd finished the indoor track, you'd walk outside and you could smell the Tyson chicken you know, mm. that didn't smell so good after you're finished a race. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and it reminds me of that place now, you know, like if I smell something similar, I'm like, oh, that's Fayetteville, which is a little bit unfair because of the location where we were at. But it's interesting to think about the smells and the sights and the, the feelings of a city. I know that there have been a lot of researchers that have been looking at, you know, how a city smells. Is this something that you've thought about in greater detail? I would like to say in greater detail, yes, but no. It's just paying attention and probably because I bike most places in the city. So I'm always aware of not just weather, but the smells of the city and why this part of the city smells one way compared to the other. You structure the book in different perspectives. So you have temporal, security, economic, spatial, social, and sacred. Which one was easiest to write about? For me, by far, it's the spatial. And that's because that's how I see the city. I'm a visual learner, which is why I was drawn towards urban planning, because I see cities. I can't travel throughout a city, any city, whether it's my city or a rural community in Oregon, and not think about like the design of the street. Is there bike lanes? There's no bike lanes. Are the buildings up front? Are they set back? Or how walkable is the community? Or is it car dependent? And so everything for me, is interpreted mainly through that filter of the spatial perspective. Is there one that you're magnetically drawn to? Beyond the spatial, it would be, like we talked about earlier, the temporal is looking at kind of the changing nature of cities, which is absolutely fascinating when we look at, you know, modern history of like the storyline of a Detroit from greatness 100 years ago to where it is at today. And then thinking through the implications, are there other cities that are just as vulnerable as a Detroit? Is the Bay Area like that? So just thinking about, again, that the idea of the rise and fall of cities and how they're dynamic and not static. I noticed a reference also to Kevin Lynch's image of the city. How much did that book influence you and perhaps maybe also a pattern language? Very much so, because in part of our course, we go out and we map a neighborhood. So we utilize his framework for mapping, whether it's looking at landmarks or nodes. We end up mapping my neighborhood. So we break up into teams and we go out, 
clipboard paper and we're drawing and then we meet up afterwards and we spend time debriefing what they saw. That's really interesting. I mean, the book is so seminal in, you know, how planners use it. It's interesting to see it, you know, used in in the way that you all are looking at it. You know, you live in in Hollywood, and I imagine that when you say that to people outside of Portland, you might get a <laughs> an eyebrow. I know of Hollywood from some of my work that I I've done in Portland, but I'm wondering if you could explain this relatively unknown to outsiders <laughs> neighborhood to folks. Yeah, I, I mean, I've been in this neighborhood for going on ten years, so it's called the Hollywood District. It's in kind of inner northeast Portland, and it's just a weird neighborhood in a good way. It's a it's a it's an anomaly in a lot of ways. So for us, what drew us here was thinking in terms of its walkability. So we had just moved to Portland from Vancouver, British Columbia, where we had lived for a few years, even as a family of five without a car. So we had grown accustomed to walkability, transit, and all that. And so when we landed in Portland, we wanted to find a similar kind of a neighborhood. And that's how we landed in Hollywood, which is definitely a neighborhood of contrast. So you have, you know, very expensive single family detached homes across the street from, you know, multi-story residential housing apartments where it's a lot of the units are affordable. And so you have Whole Foods across the street from a Dollar Tree. Yeah, it's just it's such a weird contrast and it continues to be infill with new apartments. So yeah, it's just a fun, eclectic, not in your typical Portland eclectic way, but it's just it's an eclectic neighborhood. I also enjoyed your case for the McDonald's. <laughs> why, why is that? Oh, well, just because of, you cover this in the book to a certain extent, but kind of the the standoffishness of some of the places that you mentioned, the Whole Foods and things like that, the ability of people to go in and create a third place, basically, from a McDonald's mm-hmm. where they can go and get a cup of coffee for a dollar and hang out and, uh, you know, just be. And I think that's really a good thing to remember, that there's places there that everybody can go to. Yes, to me, that's a theme that comes up a lot when I think about is just the accessibility of a neighborhood. Like if it's all a Whole Foods, then really who is that accessible or who's that for? I mean, what about having spaces in the city that, you know, that are for everyone? Doesn't matter what your socioeconomics are. Yeah. And and like I said, that piece about the students walking into the Whole Foods with you and kind of not feeling welcome, is that something that happens a fair amount when you go places with your students? Yeah, very much so. So our school has roughly 60, I forget the last number, 60, maybe upwards of 70% of our students are minorities. So when we go out and do our walking tours, to me, it's been one of the, the greatest opportunities I've had of just walking the city with students and debriefing our experiences and learning from them, particularly learning how students of color see and interact and experience the city. So when I go into a Whole Foods, which I wrote about in the book, and it's me and four young Hispanic women and 10 feet in, they kind of walk in and they stop and they're like, oh, this is kind of weird. Like there's no one like us. Or when I take my group on the coffee tour and we walk into a very well-known beloved Portland, you know, roaster and, you know, my students are kind of squirming because, and we debrief it afterwards. Like, yeah, this is weird. Everyone's looking at us. Like we're out of place. There's no one like us. So again, it just gets me thinking about like, how to see the city from other people's perspectives and how much that I've missed as well as kind of that conversation about a McDonald's is like some places are more welcoming to others and, and not just welcoming in terms of socioeconomics, but even in ethnicity as well. Mm. The roaster piece is also interesting. You mentioned in the book, how things become kind of stale. And at some point they hit a point where you have this kind of point of sameness I'm wondering if you know what that tipping point is in terms of replication. (laughs) Well, you bring up one of my pet peeves of how every new coffee shop and coffee roaster looks the same, right? And my joke is, can you have a new coffee shop without succulent plants now? (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, it, it reminds me to a degree of, it's like the new suburbanization, right? It's like, and what do we hate about the suburbs? It's kind of a sterility, uniformity of urban form. Everything kind of starts looking the same. And after a while, even in the city, in the heart of the city, 
especially with a lot of new spaces like coffee shops, et cetera, or, you know, mixed use residential, there's surprisingly a lot of uniformity and they all start looking the same. And like every coffee shop may have a different color palette, but it's like, well, looks like the last one. I mean, it doesn't mean I don't love it and appreciate it, but it's like a little creativity would be nice every now and then. Yeah. You want to, you want something different, something eclectic maybe. Yes. There's also a discussion about gentrification, but also I was interested in the in the idea of neighborhood succession. Can you explain kind of what that means? As far as like a definition, uh, thinking about what neighborhood succession is and how it how it operates and how it might be a little bit different than gentrification. Yeah, so that's a good conversation. So I try to, I mean, again, like with the topic of gentrification, I mean, there's just so many so many angles and ways to look at it to address it, to talk about it, right? And so from the urban planning side, you have that angle. From maybe the architecture side, you're looking at the actual physical homes, buildings, et cetera, from the economics perspective, from the sociology perspective, even from the history perspective. And so in that, there's, you know, kind of not on necessarily on parallel tracks, but there's also the realization that at the same time that gentrification is happening, there's also the reality of the changing dynamic of neighborhoods. And neighborhoods are never static, right? So throughout the history of a city, and in particular, the older the city is, the more this happens as neighborhoods change over and over and over and over again. So case in point, like here in Portland, we have neighborhoods that started off as you know, full of German immigrants, and then they become primarily African American. And then now because of gentrification, there's other groups that are moving in as well. So this idea of kind of neighborhood succession is kind of the migratory dynamic reality that neighborhoods are always in flux. Yeah, I think, you know, here in San Francisco, we have the Mission District, and we have Noe Valley, and you have the Castro, and, and those areas are, are known for, you know, right now, certain demographics, but they've been changing over time. There's been Italian neighborhoods, there's been Irish neighborhoods. And so I just, I thought that was interesting to think about it from that perspective, rather than just a plain gentrification narrative. And I don't mean plain in a bad way. I'm just thinking of, yeah, it's a discussion that comes up awful lot. Yeah, exactly. And that's why, again, why I love walking and biking the city, because you see things up close and you see the cornerstone of a church building that says it was founded by German immigrants in 1913. And yet, you know, then it became in the 50s and 60s, a congregation of African-Americans. And then later, you know what I mean? Just that, that reminder that neighborhoods are always in change. Doesn't mean that it's not to be dismissive of gentrification. Mm -hmm. It's just looking at that more that the longer history of the neighborhood to go, all right, well, neighborhood succession is a constant reality. And in a hundred years, how many more times will this neighborhood flip over? How much of the book was written before the pandemic versus after it started? Probably all. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was mostly written before the pandemic. Uh -huh. The reason I ask the question is because there's a lot of topics that are, you know, something that touch close to what the pandemic is doing, but not mm. necessarily like getting there. There's the safety question, which obviously yeah. Portland is kind of a hot spot for the protests and the and mm -hmm. the clash between two different groups that you don't address, obviously, because it didn't happen yet. I mean, it's been happening in Portland for a while, but not to that kind of level. Correct. But it's it's interesting to see those things and then think about the pandemic and what that's done to kind of thinking about what's in the book. Yeah. And I would have to say that if I had written it afterwards, while most of it would stay the same, I think it just adds that extra layer of, again, how do we experience cities and how does the pandemic influence our experience of the cities and how you know we're a lot more homebound we're not going out in social spaces as much in particular restaurants coffee shops etc so it really has put a damper on our experience of the cities yeah it's a bummer you can't go out i mean you can still walk around but you can't kind of experience the cities the same way and i hope we get back there soon yes i agree you mentioned before you're also an ordained pastor. There's a section that delves into kind of what is sacred, parks, churches, secular spaces, and even planning ethos to a certain extent. Do you think there's a discussion that's missing from our usual discussions about religion and, and place? Very much so. 
And I think of all of the conversations where I'm thinking about my intro to the city class, Mm -hmm. of all the conversations or of all the perspectives that we look at, the most challenging one is this idea of looking at the sacred perspective of the city. And that's because, you know, we are all products of the West and we just, we're not worldview wise, we're not accustomed to having the sacred as part of our worldview. Whereas a lot of other cultures and nationalities around the world, there is no separation, right? It's just everything is sacred where for us, it's so compartmentalized. And so it ends up being a very challenging conversation is how do we think about cities as sacred beyond simply looking at particular sacred spaces, whether it's a shrine, a temple, a church building, et cetera. So it's just, yeah, it's a fun conversation, but it's just really challenging. Yeah. It brought me to something I've been thinking about a little bit. I watched recently a kind of a documentary, I think it was Secrets of the Dead on PBS about Notre Dame. And Mm. I was actually in Paris the morning that it burned down. We took a train outside of the city that day, but uh, we were there that morning. And I don't know if there's any place, maybe there's a couple, but I don't know if there's any place that would get that reaction in the United States Mm. that Notre Dame did on that day. I mean, you know, people all over the world kind of pouring in their feelings and their thoughts and ideas about this space that was built Mm -hmm. in the center of Paris. Is there a place maybe in the United States that's like that? Or or is it, like you said, it's it's something that's compartmentalized? That's a great question. I'd have to, <laughs> I'd, have to do, I'd have to do a tour in my mind of all the cities I've been and, you know, what places stand out. But again, how much of that is related to it being a sacred space as much as just a great historical structure? Right. Or, I mean, obviously, it's a combination of both. And I don't know if there is, because of, you know, the historical nature of it, is there anything that even like, yeah, you're asking would come close in the U.S.? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, that would be hard pressed. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe if the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, knock on wood, <laughs> <Yeah>. disappeared or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the book is Intro to the City. Sean, where can folks find it if they want to? Amazon. Amazon. Can you find it at local bookstores? That's a good question. I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming <laughs> Yes. I've been promoting bookshop.org so folks it, it can support their local bookstores if they get online and, or, and order it. Some of the proceeds go to their local bookshop that maybe they can't visit in the pandemic. That's good. Yeah, for sure. Where can folks find you online if they want to find you or if you want to be found? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can find me on Twitter, on Instagram. That's the easiest way. Just at Sean Benish. Awesome. And the book is Intro to the City, 150 Observations to Understand the City. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire on the web at theoverheadwire.com. Sign up for a free trial of The Overhead Wire Daily, our 14-year-old Daily Cities news list, by clicking the link at the top right of theoverheadwire.com. And please, please, please support the pod at patreon.com slash theoverheadwire. Many thanks to our current patrons for their ongoing support. And as always, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overclass, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always find its original home at usa.streetsblog.com. Dot org. See you next time at Talking Headways.